Hi, I'm Michael Milroy, Director of Cybersecurity R&D from GE Global Research. In the next 30, 35 minutes, I'm going to take you all on a journey in, in developing one of the first AI-driven industrial immune systems, really highlighting the opportunities and challenges, the good, bad, and ugly. Uh, really lessons learned um, from developing a cyber defense to secure one of the you know, the world's most critical systems from aviation to power grids, weapon platforms to healthcare. The concepts, how we got here, starting with the, the, how we got here, the major evolution of AI for cybersecurity um, really has come from advances in storage, compute, and mathematics. And while there's a lot of noise and kind of misconceptions that AI cybersecurity is going to replace the need for human cyber defenders, take humans out of the loop, you know, we've heard the robots are coming, they're coming for your job. That couldn't be further from the truth. So I also want to kind of de demystify AI, talk about what it's really good at for this space, as well as some of the gaps and, and some of the considerations you should have when you go back to your organization. Um, so two of the critical areas there that all AI cybersecurity uh, solutions that are effective really require are number one, humans, they require deep domain expertise. And I like to think of this like you need architects and builders. So the architects in this case are the deep domain cybersecurity SMEs, the subject matter experts. The builders are your data scientists and your mathematician wizards, so to say. Without either one of those, AI cybersecurity solutions are not very effective. The other critical ingredient in this mixture here is data. You know, the old adage, garbage in, garbage out, could not be more true for these solutions. So you really need access to that training data and make sure that that data is prepped and prepared to be ingested by your machine learning algorithms. And so with this evolution, we've seen advancements from kind of a first and second wave of AI moving towards a third wave of AI, where we're really improving our contextual reasoning, our accuracy, and with this, we've seen major, major developments in you know, improving cyber threat intelligence. We're able to really tackle some of the challenges with the scale of the problem a lot, lot better. Um, but with all that, it's still not a panacea. It's not going to replace your cyber defenders. And in many cases, as we'll discuss, oftentimes you'll need more humans in the loop to really do this right. Um, so let's start out with the bad and the ugly. At least let's talk about the problem we're trying to solve here uh, before we get into some of the good and great, if you will. Uh, I like to use energy infrastructure as an example because all modern organizations are energy organizations uh, in the sense that there's not a single modern organization that could function without access to electricity. In the last 20 years, we've digitized and networked and automated our entire energy value chain. So we can look at energy infrastructure or transportation or health or defense. You're seeing this trend of the digitization networking, which has woven together our information technology and our operational technology, our cyber physical systems and this uh, incredible tapestry uh, that has uh, in significantly increased the speed, the size and the volume of data uh, requirements uh, being collected, aggregated, and exchanged. And from a cyber perspective, uh, that creates a number of challenges. But the drivers behind this is pure you know, value creation. It's made our city smart. It's helped us in the grid space balance distributed energy re resources, stochastic loads. It, made our, it makes our transportation systems uh, more efficient. It makes us better at our health diagnostics. But with all this, we, we have this big, big data problem. How do we make sense and find patterns uh, in these data sets? Again, not to take humans out of loop, at least with a lot of the traditional roles, but to make us better at what we do. Um, a grid cyber defender, a good one. If we do this right, a AI can make a good one great, but it's not, again, as we'll see, gonna take that human out of the loop. Uh, again, so that's the that's the big opportunity. The challenge in all this is a number of these IoT or industrial IoT, uh, especially the legacy systems, were never designed to be connected to the internet. Um, these are systems that prioritize functionality and ease of use. 
oftentimes lack, lack encryption, authentication, communicate in plain text. Uh, you see a lot of you know, human machine interfaces that connect to these critical systems that keep trains on the rails, defense platforms accurate and, and reliable. You see them have you know, default passwords. And so this is the challenge. It's a, it, there's a scale challenge and how do we how do we make sense of it? How do we detect and how do we monitor these large data sets? And so AI is really good at identifying those patterns. And for a lot of things like spam, uh, threat intelligence, identifying those, plot, those, those, those patterns in these large, large data sets is critical. Um, the challenge being is that our adversaries are also rapidly evolving. We have we are we are dealing with cyber adversaries. Whether we look at the Solar Winds attack, recent Solar Winds incident, or the Grid Cyber incidents or Ukraine in Ukraine, um, you, we could, or Triton, Trisus, we could go on and on. What we're seeing is we have an adversary that's complex, nonlinear, and rapidly evolving. And so we need to evolve our defenses, AI, machine learning. And I'll use them interchangeably. They are very different. I understand that. Um, we need to evolve those defenses to keep up with that threat and keep up with the tactics, techniques, procedures. Uh, and so what we did for, for what we developed this industrial immune system, we studied very closely the tactics, techniques, and procedures used by the adversary to carry out these attacks. And a couple of interesting revelations that um, really highlight the limitation of our current cyber defenses. Uh, number one, we see that an adversary doesn't always need malware or some type of zero day exploit. Once they get privileged access to your human machine interface, oftentimes organizations have no visibility into those lower layers of industrial control systems. Those critical sensors and actuators, those controllers, again, that keep trains on the rails, that keep um, transportation systems uh, reliable and safe and efficient power grids balanced. Um, those critical systems, oftentimes we don't have visibility. We saw in the Ukraine incidents, once they, once they get access to that human machine interface, no longer do they need malware. It's the, a, a legitimate command using the native protocol of the system in the wrong succession or at the wrong time or both can actually cause a physical impact. And so our intrusion detection systems that work on a signature heuristic, or we've seen these ones and zeros before, uh, and AI is really good, again, at recognizing those patterns um, are oftentimes very, very limited. So what the industrial immune system we've developed is focused much more on the physics. So we're looking at changes in voltage and frequency and ambient temperatures, uh, as well as the networking layers. And so we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, but you see that the scale of the problem and why AI applications to the space are so important. You know, 350,000 new pieces of malware registered each day. Uh, AI, again, is very, very good at recognizing those signatures and heuristics and building up our robust libraries to identify malware. But when we start asking questions around contextual reasoning, things that humans are really good at, you know, what was the motivation or behavior of our adversary? What were they doing in that German steel mill when they were laterally around to different parts of the network and then something went boom? Did they interrogate one of those systems in the wrong way that caused it to, to, to go boom? Or was that part of their goal and motivation? AI is really, really bad at that. It's really bad at understanding context. And that's really what the third wave is trying to figure out. Not patchy attacks, you know, threatened about a fifth of the world's shipping capacity, shut down other critical systems caused $10 billion worth of damage, uh, was asked to be part of the uh, expert testimony forensic team, which is made up of a very talented group of individuals, um, much more talented than myself. But that had some clear signature heuristics that machine learning AI could have potentially identified in an earlier stage. Um, but what keeps me up at night here on this slide with all these big numbers uh, is really the 2 million cybersecurity positions unf unfilled. Uh, again, for AI cyber solutions platforms to work, we need a lot more. We need deep domain cybersecurity experts to fill those roles. Uh, we need more of a diverse, we need more women, we need more people from different diverse backgrounds joining that workforce 
uh, because if not, we're going to have the same myopia a lot of our intrusion detection systems and firewalls have, is that we're all thinking through the same set of prisms and filters looking at the challenge when the adversary is evolving and very, very diverse. Uh, and then we also have to evolve to the current environment. You know, when the world flipped upside down, we, we started these unprecedented times during the pandemic, um, we saw a lot more, most organizations now operating remotely. So this remote connectivity, if your AI solutions say, wait, why, why is this substation? Why is this train? Why is this defense platform now have these remote VPNs and connections? That's an anomaly that must be uh, an attack, you're going to get prohibitive false positives and you can just throw your AI solution out the door because it recognizes patterns based on a summation of all its perceptions or previous experience that have been trained into features. And that just is not going to work well. So we saw with the pandemic this huge um, increase in our attack surface and open publicly vulnerable systems, which is absolutely frightening because these are critical systems. Uh, and so you see where AI is really good at identifying those uh, small changes in malware introduced every day, but not as good as understanding the behavior and motivation behind the anomaly. And I think in all this, and you know, uh, it's a whole separate presentation, but the current paradigms that we're using to respond to these converged IT and OT environments and are very much limited. Oftentimes we focus too much on technology and not enough on the people and process that makes those solutions holistic. And so we need to marry human and machines uh, from an AI perspective, very much so to fill some of these gaps. Um, so that is that is the problem. That's some of the bad and the ugly. I think some of the good is also, good is recognizing gaps and rec some of the major gaps in this space. Yeah, absolutely, we wanna make our AI algo algos lighter and more efficient and closer to the edge and, and better contextual reasoning. But to do that, we have to understand um, trust. We have to understand how we can establish human operator trust um, so that human machine, human um, grid cyber defenders or human cyber defenders, they trust the algorithm and how it's arriving at its conclusion. And that's part of the big challenge uh, and part of the whole area of research around explainable AI to develop high quality, interpretable, intuitive, human understandable decisions with our algorithms. Uh, a great example of that that played out and a really sad one is that uh, a couple of years ago, a suicidal German pilot took off the AI autopilot with the goal to crash a commercial airline. Uh, and so that autopilot would have self-corrected that nose diving suicidal pilot but the pilot took that off and you know, hundreds of people lost their lives. And so explainable AI and that trustworthiness, it actually goes both ways. Um, it's crazy to think, but how does that algorithm actually trust the human operator, especially in an area in cybersecurity in the cyber world where humans oftentimes are both the weakest link as well as the, the last line of defense. So there's, there's a huge area of research there and part of that research is about humble AI and improving awareness of the algorithm. Think about, imagine a fleet of autonomous drones that are about to carry out a mission uh, in cooperation with ground troops. They've locked in on a target and then all of a sudden they experience a denial of service or a jamming attack. Humble AI is part of this third wave where this autonomous uh, weaponized drones recognize their limitations, go back to the human operator and say, I have a lower degree of confidence in my threshold of decision-making that I can accurately hit this target without any casualties on the ground. Uh, and so that's where we're going with Humble AI. Um, some lighter versions of that could be with diagnostic, where an algorithm is doing a diagnostic and helping um, a, a doctor, for example, that's good helping them become great and saying, hey, I'm not quite sure with this, um, you need to check to, to, to help validate and verify my findings. Or a wind turbine generator, right? Where, you know, we think there's a fault in this fleet with one and three, but not two, I need more data. Here's my current evidence. Uh, and part of getting there, part of realizing those goals of third wave is really, you know, as Einstein reminded us, is half an answer is a really good question. And so as you go back to your organizations and you assess your own platforms, you need to ask questions like, how, how do you establish context? 
interdependently among human machine teams that are empowered by AI? How is trust affected when humans and machines depend on each other? And how should human machine teams train with each other? Really to improve the state of the art and answer these questions, we need to establish a bi-directional language of explanation to really improve context and trust between human machine teams. So again, in all this, the robots are coming, the robots are here, the AI is here, uh, but it's gonna probably, at least in the short term, require a lot more human um, domain experts uh, than a lot of people give credit. So what are some of the bad and ugly? The bad and ugly we see adversaries are also rapidly evolving their own TTP to include AI and machine learning. So one thing that the big thing that's happening right now is they're reverse engineering a lot of the AI systems so they can better understand what those decision manifolds are. They can understand that black box nature. This is how the algorithm detected and localized this specific attack. Once they understand that, that can pave the way for poisoning or enabling them to replicate the system and manipulate the system with different adversarial AI attacks. We're also seeing, and this is a whole separate presentation, but the increasing use of deep fakes in social engineering and spear phishing. We're seeing um, the use of AI for behavioral analysis to, to find that, that weaker link in the chain, if you will. Uh, we talked about reverse engineering. And then we're also seeing some you know, malware 2.0 as these you know, polymorphic AI type attacks that brute force and just keep attacking until they get around those signature heuristics in your firewall. Um, that is something uh, that has been happening for a while now. Uh, and we've all seen these, you know, the results, the impact of some of these issues and not, they're, out, they're not always malicious adversarial cyber attacks. Um, there's a huge challenge with the black box nature of AI where an algorithm arrives at its conclusion and sees that this is no longer a panda, this is a given, just with a small perturbation or small change um, in, in um, the, the, the image. Uh, we have a project going on uh, with facial recognition and AI with DARPA. And we say, well, what's the only thing that's as cute or as funny as pandas? And that's, of course, Will Ferrell. And you see what just small changes sometimes um, in the image set, uh, in the data, we can actually um, manipulate the results of the algorithm. We can cause, and, and, that's, and that's really scary. I mean, you're talking about major, major ethics issues, major bias issues, major issues, um, especially when you're talking about AI controlling um, these critical, critical systems that I'm talking about in aviation and uh, the power grid. Two of the big areas, common attacks, we talked a little bit about adversarial AI, but really think about poisoning how the algorithm is trained in development or in its cross-validation stage or even in the testing. Um, so there's poisoning and there's also evasion attacks uh, which are carefully, you know, you're carefully adjusting and misclassifying the results of the algorithm, you know, allowing that attacker to evade detection. Uh, and, and so part of the things, some of the things we can do um, to get around and defend ourselves from some of those adversarial attacks uh, are really, um, it really reaffirms the importance of understanding those near boundary conditions. So understanding um, where that algorithm fails to detect. And what you can do is during the learning stages, you continue to a, a attack um, that, that algorithm to really, really have that a really good understanding of those near boundary conditions, um, which is really an area that an adversary is gonna focus on. So having the completeness, a robust set of current boundary conditions is that absolutely critical. Um, we talked a little bit about adversarial training. Defensive distillation is a strategy where we train the model to output probabilities of different classes rather than hard decisions about which class to output. Uh, and so then those probabilities are supplied to the model and then they're training the class on those really hard labels, which makes it different, more difficult to exploit. So with all of this, with all these advances, some additional bad and ugly is, is again, AI for cybersecurity is not a panacea. Let's go back to garbage in, garbage out. You need those rich data sets. There's a limitation of cyber attack data and cyber threat intelligence. 
there's a limitation on understanding the motivation behind the attacks, why they're being carried out. So establishing those classifications and feature sets, explainable AI is very difficult. Um, there's also the issue that is, if you drop an AI solution on a network or system that's already compromised, think if you introduced an AI cybersecurity solution in the last eight months, when your network systems potentially were infiltrated through the solar winds attack. And then that solution is trained on, hey, this is what normal looks like. This is normal uh, when in fact you're compromised, you're getting a false sense of security. I think the other issue is accuracy. So if you're getting a lot of false positives, uh, like think about the, as the pandemic hit, we all started to work for, uh, remotely, work from home. Um, if your algorithms and solution wasn't agile and adaptable to that and could be tuned and trained, um, you're going to get prohibitive numbers of false positives and just turn the, turn the thing off. It, it's not going to be uh, effective at all. And then in the OTICS space, where you have a lot of stochastic loads, you have transients, you have computational environmental human factors that are changing what normal looks like. Establishing that manifold is very, very difficult. Uh, a great example of that is think about a jet engine. You know, how do you develop an industrial immune system for a jet engine that's flying at different times through different environments? There's a lot of pollutants uh, in certain environments, certain heat that will cause a faster degradation curve of that system. And so how does your AI solution adapt and recognize those natural degradation curves from the environment or from how it's being operated. Not a trivial task to do, especially considering those requirements to get it right, is that you can't have those false positives or it's not effective. And so I, you know, the solution we developed, part of our journey, it's called Digital Ghost. Uh, we wanted to take a very different approach based on some of those very sophisticated attacks, sophisticated attacks and incidents we discussed earlier. Uh, we wanted to look at the physics of these systems because, well, you can flip a bit, a one or zero to get around a signature heuristic. There's polymorphic attacks, AI attacks that are gonna get around your firewalls. The physics are more difficult to spoof. And we have deep, deep domain expertise in the physics of our assets. We take a defense in depth approach uh, so to develop uh, Digital Ghost, we really brought together these really, really uh, impressive uh, multidisciplinary teams from different backgrounds, looking at you know, everything from how white, ce white um, cells attack in your, your body's immune system attack, um, different viruses and different diseases when you're attacked. We looked at this from a very, very diverse uh, perspective. Uh, and what we started out with is, again, you, those two core components to any effective AI cyber solution. You need the, the domain expertise in the space and the data scientists, of course, is part of that. And then you also need these really rich big data sets to train. Uh, and then once you have those, what we've developed, uh, we start off with a digital twin. Uh, so our digital go starts out with a digital twin. This is high fidelity, almost living, breathing a a asset of the system. Uh, including a high fidelity view of the control systems of the controllers, right? Because the controllers can dictate the physics of the overall system. And so these are highly complex, tightly coupled systems of systems with hundreds of sensors. Um, and so changes in the environment and operations and degradation curves can really change what normal looks like. So it's not easy to get right. But this is where, this is the area we are operating in because we, again, back to some of those early incidents, um, we've realized that once an adversary gets in and they no longer need malware to cause damage, we need to be able to look at the health of the system, not only from a cyber attack perspective, but also from a fault. We actually care less about what's causing the actual system to operate outside of its manifold. Uh, and we'll work, we have this ability in doing this and taking this approach to use our 40 machine learning algorithms to detect and localize where we've been attacked. So here, once we have that digital twin up and we're training and learning, we're attacking it constantly using very sophisticated attacks to establish our manifold of what's normal, what's an attack, what's a fault, establishing our features. 
And this is exactly the type of solution you're going to see that is, is different than some of the failures we've seen with, uh, let's say, the Ukraine grid cyber attacks, Stuxnet, SolarWinds, and that we're not focused on the ones and zeros at the networking layer. We're, again, focusing on what normal looks like. So whether this is an insider attack, a zero day exploit, operator error, either way, the, machine, the digital ghost immune system is gonna recognize that it's operating out outside of its normal manifold. It's gonna detect uh, in real time exactly which one of those sensors is being manipulated, localize the sensor, and then it's gonna use those algorithms and those other sensors that are not compromised to neutralize the impact of that attack. Uh, and this is really a new paradigm in cybersecurity. This is a completely different approach. Uh, we're saying that in these converged ITOT environments uh, with international supply chains, with hundreds of thousands of lines of code with malicious insiders, an adversary is gonna find a way to get in they're gonna find like solar wind, some type of way to get privileged access to your device. This is more of a resilient solution and that once an adversary gets in, we can respond, recover and endure these attack and keep these critical assets running while under attack. Uh, and I, I wanna conclude um, with what, what exactly does that look like? Uh, but again, here you see, you know, currently when there's some type of fault or attack on a sensor, sensor actuator, uh, in a combined cycle power plant, for example, as seen, it could take hours, hundreds of hours to, to locate which sensor went bad because you have this transient tight, tightly coupled system. And where one thing goes wrong, it's gonna have an impact on the system of systems. So in addition to detecting, localizing, neutralizing cyber attacks, the other really exciting thing here is we're no longer looking at cyber so cybersecurity is just a cost. We're finding real ways here um, to reduce operations and maintenance, in, improve efficiency, improve production, include, improve energy management, and then again, back to making a good operator great. Uh, and so that's what, you know, that's what we're doing here. Very, very different. It's not a panacea, but it's a unique way. It's a unique approach to plot to apply advances in AI, machine learning, uh, advances in physics, uh, advances in compute, storage, mathematics to really improve the state of the art. And so this is what it looks like. Um, this is um, um, some of the live testing that we actually performed on, on one of the world's largest combined cycle power plants um, where we said, we put on our, our hacker hats and we said, if we wanted to cause damage um, to this critical system, what are the sensors, actuators, control systems that we would try to manipulate um, to cause the most damage to the system in a very, very stealthy way? And you see the truth versus the neutralization algorithm of reconstructed. Um, so even well on, during an attack, the scent we're using those machine, those algorithms to reconstruct the attack sensors. The other way this could have played out is we saw with Stuxnet. With Stuxnet, you had three zero-day exploits. You had the human-machine interface telling the, the scientists that everything's okay. You know, it's uh, the centrifuge is, let's say, spinning at 30,000 RPM when it was potentially spinning at 60,000 RPM and causing degradation and destruction of the asset and a loss of trust between these human-machine teams. Uh, and so, well, the detection and localization algorithms are very, very mature. We demonstrated 99% uh, accuracy. So this was a major scientific accomplishment. Um, even with all that, um, and we've demonstrated neutralization, major scientific accomplishment. Even with all that, as I mentioned earlier, this is not a panacea. The gaps, the areas, um, the research gaps here are, are very much related to human machine interdependence, trust, uh, explainable AI, humble AI. It's only with those advances and filling those gaps will we get to the third wave where artificial intelligence is in fact intelligent. Um, we're far, we're still, we still have um, a number of barriers to that as I mentioned. So in conclusion, 
and, and realizing here I'm getting low on time, you know, these are some of our results. When you go back to your organization, when you either assess your current AI driven solution or consider investing in one, um, know that know what they're good at and know where there's gaps. Know where the opportunities and challenges are. Know the good, bad, and ugly, if you will. Um, remember that this is not going to replace your cyber team. So if you're a CISO or in some type of cybersecurity role and considering an investment in AI-driven solution, you know you need to really, really understand things like what's your level of false positives? Are you able to detect and localize attacks in a converged ITOT environment? What type of OT protocols can you handle? Are you just dealing with networking layers? You're just dealing with TCP IP. Um, remember, also remember that for any solution to be effective, it's not about technology. It's also about the people and process. The form of the technology has to complement the function of the team. Uh, and so AI cyber, as we learn, is very good to help us scale and deal with the, the increase in volume of attacks, not a panacea. We know that as we adopt new AI type dri driven solutions and new TTP and new frameworks, our adversary will continue to adopt similar solutions to exploit the asymmetries, which will continue most likely to be um, in their uh, advantage. Um, so with that, I conclude, really appreciate the opportunity to um, join the RSA team talented team and uh, audience. It's great to be back. Please stay in touch. Thank you very much.